This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at fbhp.com. With Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, and we are so thrilled to be joined by our preseason TV announcers, the best (laughs) preseason team in the entire NFL, Charles Davis, Paul Burmeister, Welcome to the Bet MGM Studio. Welcome to Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park, and welcome back for 2024. Now I'm nervous. Yeah, you too. But, <laughs> but, but, but I'm glad we got in our contract. I'm glad we got in our contract. He has to say that. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> he just snuck that in there. I, I like, like it that. Was his idea. But you yeah. think about that. I mean, Charles Davis. He's got like 17 jobs. But they both have like 17, 17 jobs. jobs. <laughs> Paul Burmeister, getting ready to do the Olympics for NBC for yes. how, how many times is this? So this will be my third summer, and I, I've had a couple winners. So, so five. Look at there him. we go. Oh, You're like the them. five-time hosts of SNL then. You sort get a of. jacket yeah. and a He's song. in the club. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's in the club. I should get something a little extra for my fifth one. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually – I have a new assignment for the summer games. Instead of water polo, I'll be calling rowing and canoeing. Which I'm in the process of learning as we speak. Right rowing, now. rowing eights, eights, eights with Cox. Could be single. Could eight. be single skull. Could be fours. Could be doubles. Doubles. Sweep or skull. That's right. It's a, there's a lot to okay, learn. Okay, so sure. Let's stop. Yeah. For, let's stop for a second. The Olympics are in Paris this summer. They are. When is the rowing? The rowing will be the first of the two weeks, and then it might bleed a little bit into the second week, okay. and that's when the canoeing comes in a little more, I do believe. But they're each uh, about a week, and I will call, I think it's on a Friday, maybe August 9th, I will call an event for the Olympics, and then I'll get on a plane, fly down here, hopefully be there with production meetings. I'll just follow Charles's lead, and we will call the first Titans preseason game against the Niners the next night. So you cool? will do Whoa. the Olympics on NBC the day before you will call the Titans preseason opener with the Niners? Yes. The man does it all. When I worked for the Olympic Committee, 1990-94, to 94, we had the Barcelona Olympic Games. That was the first dream team in Barcelona. But my assignment was to head up from the Olympic Committee side the U.S. delegation, Rowing Village. Oh, wow. Really? And we were in Banyolis, which was about an hour outside of Barcelona. And I was there approximately a month yeah. during that time frame and just had a blast. And that's when I learned my Your rowing. Your rowing words. Yeah. <laughs> that's when I learned all my rowing, which led me into The Boys in the Boat. Yes. Phenomenal book. Terrific movie. But Paul's going to be doing all the stuff that I learned, which is really kind of cool. The anecdotal connections on Charles Davis, like th- there's no end to it. <laughs> no end to it. There's that's, no end. That's why I learned about all the stuff he's talking about. I didn't know we had a about. rowing connection, but, but now we do. But here's the thing. When Charles Davis is in a room with Dave McGinnis, mm. <laughs> there is nobody in the world. I was that just they there. Don't, I know. Coach Mack. It's amazing. Yeah. Between the two of them, they have a connection <laughs> to some person <laughs> In every yes. corner yes. of the universe. I can't keep up with Coach Mack, though. Yes. Coach well, Mack's I the best. don't know, though. Coach we Mack's the best. for maybe 45 minutes yesterday, and I think we covered the entirety of the universe. <laughs> and every single person was like, oh, yeah, yeah I know him from yeah. this. Oh, yeah, we talked about that Co- guy. It was great. Yes, Did you Coach see Mack. the movie about him? I knew him back in <laughs> oh, forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. That's sure. Coach Mack. I just lived yeah. that in your office. I know. Uh-huh. With those two. What would you guess my contribution to those 30 minutes where I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Not Co- many words, no. just a lot of reactions. Co- Co- Coach, Coach Mack has Sounds. done it all yeah. and seen it all. He has yeah. done it, seen it, anticipated it, predicted it. Yes. <laughs> turned, all it happened. turned it down. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taken it and turned it down or had it given to him and turned it down. <laughs> Sh- shaped it in a different way. Oh, gosh. Yeah. He's the best. All right. So I know you love the Olympics. I do love the Olympics. What do you want to ask Paul Burmeister about covering the Olympics for NBC this summer? Uh, The only question that I can really ask is how do you wrap your mind around a sport that you're not super familiar with? I'm gathering, you don't know much about rowing, but you've got to learn about it and use the rowing words that we just learned together in a broadcast. Yeah. I've had, had, fortunately at this point, this is starting year 11 for me at NBC. So I think because of the Olympics, all of us who are on air 
kind of are used to learning these sports that we didn't really grow up with. So I've had some experience with it. I'm also very lucky that my wife is the only Hall of Fame rower the University of Iowa has ever produced. So she's the only one in the hall in their 30 years of having the program. So I've got some automatic help at home. But I I do have a system when I get assigned by the higher-ups, a sport that I'm not that familiar with, uh, that I just kind of start from here. And thankfully... Uh, there's there's a wonderful analyst. There are wonderful people in research. We have uh, taped recordings of the broadcast from Tokyo uh, and also Rio. And I just go to school on all of it. I develop my own little lane of the terms, how the broadcast sounds best, what's my job within the broadcast. I'm not the expert. I'm just the one who tries to make sense of all of it. So uh, by trial and error, I have a system when I have these kind of challenges. And I, I will follow that formula and I will stay in my lane. Yeah, two things on that. His wife, Anne, would have been an Olympian rower, save for an injury. So we would, wow. would have had that connection. Went into the University of Iowa Hall of Fame last fall. So Paul was able to attend it before he went to an assignment. <laughs> I mean, this, this family, they go. They yeah. absolutely go. And real quick, Paul, how many different sports now have you had to pick up that you yeah. weren't? familiar with yet you broadcast them with extras because you do tour de france every year Mm -hmm. now you're picking up the rowing yep hosted premier league a a fair bit which has been a wonderful assignment so i I, did a really good job with that he's great i'm I'm just getting that yeah very late in my life i'm coming (laughs) to that but i I find all the talk very interesting and Mm -hmm. the ins and outs of who's involved and he he can tell you all the leagues how how relegation works relegation is is interesting i mean it's it's really fascinating wonderful league to follow and i I would say two things on that to answer your question it's about 10 or 11 sports now wow every single one i get a little more, more and more comfortable with but as long as you bring up the premier league i've got two things going for me there number one before i even worked in that sport i realized around our building all these people whether it's the coordinating producer or the main researcher the main host the main analyst these people are really damn good like <laughs> they're setting a very good example oh yeah then they called me into it so i had this old feeling like i used to have in football when i was a freshman i get to call a play in the huddle with the guys who started this overwhelming feeling of I don't want to be the one to screw this up because these guys are really, really, really good. (laughs) And even as a a 53-year-old man now, that feeling still drives me. Everybody around me on that team is so damn good that I am motivated to just not drag it down. That helps me a lot, number one, is is that kind of motivation and a little bit of pressure that the high standard they've set. And the number two, the research team for the Premier League team at NBC is an A+. Plus. I mean, as long as we're talking Olympics, they are gold medal level. So I've got some things working for me in terms of motivation by their standard and the help around me. That, um, like if you've watched and thought, Paul's not screwing this up, I've got some help, <laughs> both uh, externally and, and internally on that. I think, uh, and this is an ultimate compliment, but I think you are Jim Nance level at using your analyst. Thank and you. I, I think at everything you do, whether it's Tour de France or – or the Premier League show, or whatever, and yeah. and just working with Charles in in Co- our preseason co-sign. games. Cosine, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you I, both. Because That's, I mean, I yeah. think he is the gold standard in setting up an analyst. There you go. I, I think you have that quality. Thank you. That's really nice. I mean, that that is a trained eye and ear that says that, and that's my best friend in the business saying <laughs> that too. So thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. When it comes to the Olympics, there has to be a little bit of extra pressure, though. I mean, this is the top when it comes to mm-hmm. sporting events. It's not it's not even like the Super Bowl. I mean, it's bigger than that because it's so it, – it's international. It's right. worldwide. It's the pinnacle of <laughs> sport. I mean, is there an extra sense of that pressure or that feeling that you feel in your stomach? For sure, especially with a sport like rowing where, like, the masses are going to tune in to watch swimming and track and field and the things that take up a lot of the prime time as they should. The people who are paying attention to rowing, they know it inside and oh, out. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't want to offend those people. I have so much respect for the fact that, I mean, a lot of them did it themselves. It's a difficult sport and they care about what's happening, especially at this time of the calendar in their sport. So I feel that pressure that I talked about as well from, sure. from the Premier League team being good. I want the people who care about rowing to tune in and have the play-by-play person live up to their standard and know the terms and know the stories. So that's where I say, like, I stay in my lane on these new sports. I will learn. I actually just asked our analyst, Lindsay Shoup. I said, hey, this is a little bit nerdy, and it's some work on your part. Can you give me the 20 terms 
that you know I have to know. They have to come off my tongue easily. Got to use them in the right way that the people who are watching who know rowing, they're like, this dude knows what he's talking about. And she just sent them to me. And I uh, said, I'm just getting on a flight for Nashville. Can you use one? I haven't read it yet. <laughs> I told her. I, I said, you're to doing Titans right now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I said, I'm going to have my football brain turned on in the next two days. But when I get home on Thursday night, I'm going to be all about this. So as I say, like a lot of nerdy ways to try and deal with that pressure that I do feel because it is a massive, massive deal uh, to broadcast the Olympics. How many different sports has Charles Davis called? More than you would think. Mm. I know. This is, yes. this is a good question, actually. Football, basketball, baseball, softball, softball volleyball. Golf. Golf. Track? Nope, no track. I think that's it. Racing? Uh, nope. What about no, but like I Like I covered stuff like that as like a reporter, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't didn't calling call it. it. Yeah. Uh. I, one of my proudest moments was covering a golf tournament, and I was like the field guy. The PGA Tour pros, and they qualify for the PGA, top 20 people. Mike um, Small? The head coach of University of Illinois, really good player, right? So he qualifies. He was qualifying every year. Bottom line was at one point, I hear in the from the producer, hey, Charles, can you call that putt from such and such, such and such? Then I just went back to him and said, you know something? If I start reading putts, now we're committing fraud. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not cool. I said, that's not cool for the people but who are playing. But didn't you run the tournament at Disney? R ran a tournament, but – not a player like you know i could i can i can do the mentality of a person who played a sport doing golf but the idea of reading putts what club selection of the people who play it at the highest level that's not right like you need to have someone who really knows what they're talking about and i just told him i said i can't do that i said that's fraud because if i'm reading a putt how the heck do i know what i'm really right. reading like you know, yeah. if I'm going to break 90, it's a big day for me. We're not doing that. And he understood and respected that. And the person who was doing play-by-play -play that day was one Brian Anderson. Oh, Brian wow. Anderson. Oh, wow. yeah. of TNT. Brian yeah. Anderson we talked about that afterwards. Fantastic. Isn't he yeah. phenomenal? Yeah. Yes. He is so great and, and you know, He's handles good on things. football, too. He's good he, at everything. Listen, yeah. Brian can do everything. But you it, know that. Isn't that a great example of what he just explained about knowing that he shouldn't go there and read a putt? Of the, the fine line it is for guys like you and me. We need to say yes yeah. to almost every we single. And we did. <laughs> you not as much now with, 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 with the seat that you're holding yep. at CBS, but you came up the exact same way I did. We say yes. Say yes. And we try and, and do it well. It but you also have to know where you're going to get yourself into a bad spot. Yep. And it's it's not very often you can raise your hand and say that, but but every now and then you get to. You know, calling a volleyball match, at least I've done that. Okay, at least I've played volleyball somewhere. At the highest level, no. But at least I know the basics, understand what they're doing, the whole deal. You were the man in gym class. Oh, gym class. I was volleyball, right? Crushing it, man. <laughs> crushing it. There's a couple bloody noses now. But <laughs> wow. reading the putt for someone who's trying to, to compete for a spot to right. play in the PGA. It's a good sense. I just didn't think it was right. Well, but here's the thing, and I don't know if you guys would agree with this or not. They say that people who can coach who are good coaches can coach anything mm, because true. it's a skill set. Is it kind of the same in broadcasting where if you can speak about a sport and you can talk about what you're seeing, you can apply those skills to multiple different sports. It's not just knowing the ins and outs of a specific sport, right? I think That's so. true. I, I think so in so many ways, Amy, and I think all of us can do a lot of those things, but we better know our lane in terms of doing it, and it's going to be three different things. Are we doing it as a reporter, field reporter, while the action's going on? Are we doing it as an analyst? Are we doing it as a play-by-play -play person? All three of those come with different deals. So for me, the you know, as an analyst, the higher you advance up, the less credibility you have if you haven't been involved in that sport, mm -hmm. All right? Like if I'm calling a little league baseball game, no one's going to spend a whole lot of time on it. But if all of a sudden I'm telling, you know, I'm calling the Atlanta Braves Cleveland Guardians game, that might be a problem, yeah. all right? <laughs> That's where you got to kind of kind of fit your spot. But I think all of us can do that, can adapt, can make that all work because we're all going to work at it. But again, knowing where your spot is, what do yeah. you think? I, I think I think I, I'm glad that you brought up the three positions that you could be doing that in reporter, analyst, or host. Reporter, and, I can do it all. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You can report on anything. I think you can host anything. Charles brings up a great point. If you're the analyst, if you don't have a real background in that sport, a lot of the audience is gonna be like, Why am I listening to this guy? Even if you're doing a good job. Doesn't like, matter. You could pick any sport, Charles could be the analyst. Some people at home might be like Hold it a minute. I don't, I don't think Charles was a great 
golfer or whatever yeah. the sport is? Why is he the analyst? Why Whereas the analyst? in my role as the host, if I learn the storylines, if I know what matters on that day, if I know what my analysts like to talk about, and I know how to interpret the games with the name and the rules and kind of the, the very basics, I can host it. I can't be an analyst, but I can tee the guys up and decide when it's time to move on and do it all over again. But how hard is it to keep everything separated? <laughs> Very. For, for, I'm yeah. Talking, yeah, because I'm talking about you're going from Premier League to rowing to coming here to do our right. preseason games, and you're doing college football. And Right. I mean. I've, I've, I've learned it's a great question. It's one that comes from the mind of, the, of, a, of a guy who's been calling events for a long time. I had, a, I think, a four-day stretch this winter where I hosted the Premier League on a Friday. Okay. I had to call because for the Winter Olympics, I do ski jumping, and there was a big national event that weekend. So I called a ski jumping international event on either Saturday or Sunday, and then I had a Big Ten basketball game early in the week. <laughs> sure. So it's like Put it all together. I, I've learned how to compartmentalize and, to be honest, not panic at the beginning. At a point in my career where that week, and it doesn't happen that often, where that week would have folded me in terms oh, of yeah. I would have panicked and I wouldn't have known how to prepare. I'm like, I don't want to screw up any of this. I'm going to screw up part of it. Um, now I know, okay, I'm going to spend the right amount of time in my lane on those three things. When I wake up Friday, I am nothing but Premier League. I'm thinking those terms. I'm thinking those analysts. I'm thinking that weekend on the pitch and that's it. I'll get in the car and drive home and be nothing but ski jumping. Ski jumping's done. I'm nothing but basketball. So even though those days are close together, I don't mix when I have that many jammed together. So what you're saying is you're taking your biology exam on Friday. There you go. You're taking your algebra exam on Saturday, and you're taking your English exam on Sunday. Right. That's the mentality of it. Exactly, because – I wouldn't do this in football, but there are other sports because it's not native to me. If I'm not really careful, if I'm not really prepared, if I'm not super aware that a mistake like that could happen, I could say the football equivalent of, he kicked a touchdown. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kind of funny, but kind of like not that, so great. that Killer. could happen if you're not really, really on top of it. When you're going from ski jumping uh, coming off the heels of soccer when neither one of those two sports were your main thing growing up. So I just, again, I come back to this feeling of being a little bit scared. When you're a little bit scared of what's coming, I think it, it forces you into some extra prep. I love that. And didn't we all learn those kind of lessons along the way? We learned it from different people. I know you did. I know you did. Heck, you guys have taught me different things along the way. But Andrew Monaco is now the play-by-play -play voice at Texas A&M. Okay. I came up through the ranks with him at Sunshine Network, which yeah. is now Fox Florida, I think, and you know all that. And I remember him telling me as I got going in it that he does what you know, like let's say we're getting ready for a football game. He's spending this amount. This t today is the home team. Tomorrow's the visitors. He didn't mix, and taught me a little bit of a lesson there because if you if you go on everything at one time, sometimes oh yeah, you conflate a player. Yeah. And he doesn't exist or he's on the wrong team. He's on the wrong side of the ball. He said, I try and keep it this day. I'm doing this team this day. I'm doing this team. And I thought it was a great lesson. And I've, I continue to apply it today. And I always remember what he taught me about. That. But what's interesting about you, Charles, is you had to do so many sports before you really got to go forward at the sport that you played yeah. at a high level. Yeah. And, and I think Paul made the point earlier, and I know all of us have done it. When someone came to you to do a broadcast, you said, yes, there's yeah. reps. There's reps for all of us. Yes, yes, yes. And trying to figure it out and trying to go and trying to learn it. And I started out with football, but I did so many other things along the way and then was able to come back where football became mm -hmm. the one. So I was pretty fortunate that way. And with Charles, it's not just the saying yes. It's the saying yes and doing it like it's like there's no place else he'd want to be. Right. I remember one of my first professional memories of Charles, I think it was 2007. It was the, it was <laughs> the first, first met. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was the first Senior Bowl that we worked together. And we used to go down there for the whole week. It was Charles, Mike Mayock, myself, and a couple others. We had a great time. <laughs> I didn't know him that well in 2007. Uh, but at the end of the week, and Charles and Mike and I would be on the set for during practice and all that, got to the game, and Charles was on the sideline. He was the reporter. And I remember thinking, I think Charles probably should be in the booth calling the game. And he felt the same way. And I remember talking to him about it before. It was a cold, rainy <laughs> afternoon. And I don't remember the specifics of the conversation, but I know Charles was disappointed that he wasn't in the booth. And I remember thinking, 
yeah, I'd kind of feel the same way. That game started, that red light went on, and with the rain coming down, you would have thought being on the sideline was what Charles <laughs> had worked for for the last month in the only place in the sporting world he wanted to be because he was prepared, he stood tall, he spoke with conviction. And like I, I think about that to, to this day, not just because Charles is sitting there, but we all kind of have a Rolodex of good lessons in our professional minds. And I remember how well he did in horrible conditions that day with a job that he knew he probably should be doing one up. Nobody would have known it. And I remind myself of that quite a bit. Oh, that's very nice. And you're not going to get to where you want if you don't do what, what they ask you to do. Yeah, exactly. And do it well. Right? You're not going to get there, right? It's the old lesson, how do you get your next job? Be great in the job you're yeah, currently exactly. in. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's what our friends at SeatGeek patterned their <laughs> business after. I love it. Thank you. SeatGeek <laughs> is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any other live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. So Titans fans can and, fan. That and, one almost killed me, Mike. I like <laughs> that it. was good. And the SeatGeek Terrace. <laughs> yeah. That's right. SeatGeek yeah. Terrace here at the facility. Turn oh, fan yeah. into a verb. Why not? Thank yeah. you. Sure. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. That's uh, what we do. Why are you people here? <laughs> why, 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 did you guys just wander in here? Yeah, yeah, What's going on? I mean, Where's security? Dude, he's getting security? ready for. Yeah. Paul's getting ready for the Olympics, and Charles is. You're doing 900 different things. Yeah. Why be at Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park to see the Titans in June in minicamp? You want it first? I, I think for me, a couple of things come to mind. Number one, there are only 32 of these jobs from, for, to be the play-by-play -play voice of a preseason. These, the, it's one of the small cap secrets of something you really, really want to do in this business. Yes. 32 of us get to do it. There are 300 of us who would like to do it. Why? Because it's helpful for what's coming in the fall. Like we're all lucky enough to be in the booth in the fall, September through November for you guys through January. And it's a wonderful way to get started. And at, I mean, at the core, a lot of this, we're fans. And to get to know a team this well, to come into a building, talk to the general manager, talk to you about how the team was put together, uh, that fifth-round pick, here's his story, it's fun. Like, I really enjoy it. So I think it's helpful. I think as a fan, it reminds me of, of how much I just like learning about the team. And there aren't that many positions. I'm lucky because I, I think I've got a handful of them where you get to work with people like you truly like a lot as just as friends. And getting to know you has been a lot of fun. Getting to know you as examples of the Titans community that care about the product doesn't happen everywhere. So we're a part of that. Well, thank you. And Charles, like I said, it's no BS. He's one of my first friends at the national level in this business. He's one of my dearest friends, not just in the business, but in my life. So it's just, it's fun and it's, it's special. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And we get to get ahead a little bit. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm getting ready for the, the season. So when the season begins... Even though when you call preseason football, you're not diving fully into the opposition, you still have them down on your board and you know a little bit. At least I get a base. And it's one of those crazy, really good years in terms of this for me. Your preseason schedule is San Francisco, Seattle, New Orleans. Working for CBS, that's not a normal pattern of teams I get to see. So guess what? If they come up during the year, at least I got a base. I got a base to start sure. from. And, you know, I've seen them a little bit. I know the coaching staff is. It, it helps me throughout the season. And being able to do Tennessee, the only thing that is really tough, and and I always, you know, I don't agonize over it, but it's the same thing. And I actually talked with it with every coach I've worked with here. Remember, during this time frame, I'm your guy. <laughs> right? I am your guy. But, but when we come here in September – and I'm now with CBS, I'm your guy, but guess what? The spin isn't always a positive going this way for right. what you're doing. Yeah. It might be the other way. So I just don't want you to get fooled. <laughs> you know, I don't want you to think that, hey, because sometimes you have people go, hold on a second. Didn't I see you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you yeah. did. So it's one of those weird fine lines. In fact, when Paul and I were together at NFL Network, do you remember that there was at one point – from our then management, there was okay. a discussion that none of us were going to be able to do preseason football. Yes, because really, because it was confusing. No, because they were worried that we now were in the pocket of. I remember oh. the comments. Don't like seeing you with Wearing. that team's polo on. Like, yes, 
You're supposed to be. You're supposed you're, to be NFL Network and neutral. Not just one team. Yeah. And that was a big discussion. And at one point, we almost all got pulled. Or that, were, there were a lot of us. There's doing, a bunch doing of us that. doing yeah. it, and they were saying it. And I remember at one point when that was said, I said, "Well, hold on a second. I said, if I turn on NFL Network, and I watch certain panel discussions." And those people give an analysis and sit there and go, yeah, how about your Cowboys? How about your Eagles? How about your – because they played for those teams? Yeah. What's the difference? What's the difference? Yeah, it's a great point. I said, what are we doing? I said, because you promote that. Yeah. I mean, you actually – hey, Michael, what about your Cowboys? Yeah. Hold on a second. You're telling us we can't do preseason football? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying my words did it. I'm not saying that. It was a great but, reaction. But that was my reaction, and that's what, what I said. I don't know what other people said. Yeah. But it eventually went away. But it was. You remember that discussion? Yeah. No. That was big. I said, hold a second. We're about to lose paychecks. You know I said? Yeah. I said, I wonder if I could go to the bosses at that team and see if we can wear coat and ties. Yeah. Just, just, just to get out of His wearing His reaction was better than mine. <laughs> Yours was better. I will say in journalism school, they told us that you couldn't use I or we in relation to a sports team yes. unless you got a paycheck from, from that, that team. team. Mm. So you bet your bottom dollar I found a job where I was getting a paycheck <laughs> from that team because that was a hard 11 rule. 11 years later, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. That was a hard is. rule for me to follow. Um, Charles, you made a good point, though, about not – and not even the exposure that you have to the Titans in calling the games and getting to know yeah. this team on that level, but the other teams that you're able to see, because there's a lot of information in the National Football League to keep in your brain, and we've talked about keeping sports separate, mm-hmm. but keeping teams separate has got to be a challenge too. When you're seeing completely different teams week after week after week, that's got to be a, a hard season to navigate and keep everything straight and everything in a line how how do you do it (laughs) i think i do it the same way everyone else does we all have different processes and how we go about it but i just think you find a way to identify each team with whatever your identifiers are going to be whether it's through the coaching staff through ownership through how they run offense through how they there's certain things that make up each team that you identify with quickly and I don't know about you guys, because you've got you've had you've had college, pro, high school, little league. We've all done all the different things. I think the NFL easy is the wrong word, but the familiarity comes better. But for Paul, this is an interesting year to do Titans preseason because he comes in last year. It's his first year, and he's learning all of this, and then we change it. Change everything. Everything is new. So you, so, so you much watch new. It. Yeah, yeah, so much new. It's <laughs> like your first year all over again. Right, but I, I think that adds to, and I would have been fired up if, if, if it was all the exact same sure. for the reasons we talked about. But I think there's an extra layer or three or four of interest in what we're doing this August because of how much brand new there is. Yes. Yeah. Brand new, all the coaching spots. Well, people want to tune in and kind of get to know not just the head coach, but the coordinators and the position coaches. And we get to do that in the preseason. We can't do yeah, that in October, fun. November. So that's fun. And then if you think about the way a lot of the fans watch a football game, quarterback, receiver, running backs, a lot of new there oh. too. And I know Will Levis isn't new, but it's new that he's the man. Mm -hmm. So that's fun. The wide receiver game is all kinds of fun. The running back combination is going to look a lot different than the running backs have around here recently. So for a lot of reasons, I I think that new you're talking about just makes what we get to do in August a lot more fun. Yeah, it is. It's going to be a blast. When the word dropped that the Titans were hiring Brian Callahan as the head coach the first text I got was from Charles Davis. Because Charles knows him intimately and personally <laughs> somehow. I'm but sure what if of you it. would have seen <laughs> I'm sure Brian of it. greet Charles at practice yesterday. Yeah. Then you would understand okay. I mean they, they they obviously had formed a bond at his time yeah. in Cincinnati. Ah. I've gotten lucky because when I joined CBS with Ian Eagle and Evan Washburn, they told me this is what works for us in preparation. Would you would you consider doing it this way? Because I'm brand new to the team. Yeah, sure. Now, normally, you know what it's like production meeting, right, Paul? Well, explain Mike, what a production meeting is, So production is, meeting, when you get into a production meeting, you're meeting with the team. You know how this goes, Amy, because you do it all the time, too. And typically at a production meeting, it's the play-by-play person, analyst, sideline person, producer, director, hopefully not too many more people than that. We try and keep it really reduced because – 
the people that we're talking to don't really know us. And the more people are in the room, the less information you're getting. They're not talking. They're not yeah. talking. So you, you try and keep it limited so they get to know you a little bit and so on and so forth. And typically at a production meeting, you're going to meet with who? Head coach, offense coordinator, defense coordinator, starting quarterback, one or two other players. So what Evan and I had said was they had gone to a system where the analyst would talk with the coordinators offline, bring information back to the group, and then when we meet, it's just the head coach, the starting quarterback, and one or two other players, much more efficient, much quicker, so on and so forth. I said, cool, so that works out great. So I talk with all these coordinators now offline, just me and them. And over the years, I'm talking with Brian Callahan, and I made it a rule that even if they didn't call plays, I still talk to them because they've done all the work all week. Sure, mm-hmm. They've done everything but call the play on Sunday. So that's how I got to know Brian. I knew his dad at Nebraska, and Randy Jordan was his dad's running backs coach at Nebraska. And I still remember being in an elevator, and Randy wants to talk golf because I was still doing golf channel <laughs> at the time. I want to talk football. And then I got to see Randy out at practice the other day. Yes, so you see how it all keeps yes. swirling mm-hmm. around. And if you forge a bond, a relationship, and some of those you have more of than others, you know right. how it is. I mean, some coaches are a little more giving. Some are not. You right. know, yeah. not. Or, you, or, or they may think you didn't come off right and they don't want to. Do, you never know what it's going to be. But fortunately enough, I got to know Brian that way. And it was really, really cool when you guys hired him. Good stuff. Yeah. We could do this all day. Well, I think we have now. <laughs> <laughs> and the people listening and watching do too. Charles Davis and Paul Burmeister will be back in August to call Titans preseason games with Corey Curtis. Yes, mm-hmm. looking forward to seeing Corey WKRN again. WKRN and uh, excited to have those games, all three games on, on Channel 2 in Nashville and throughout the state of Tennessee. It is an honor to have you both here, Paul Burmeister, Charles Davis. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. For Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith. Thanking you for being with us on the OT. Welcome to the big show where the legends go.